Hi again, and uh, welcome to the third uh, in a three-part lecture series for week one of American Governmental Systems. Um, this video lecture will be discussing um, types of democracy, uh, political power, and kind of where we stand at the United States in terms of citizenship, power, democracy, etc. And we'll kind of wrap up uh, this first section, this first uh, part of Unit 1 um, after this week we will be covering the Constitution, kind of the origins of American democracy, uh, followed by um, federalism, and then we'll have our first test. So this is kind of the last wrapping up this introductory part on um, on the introduction to American government. I also would expect that you'd read chapter one from the Wilson book, um, which will kind of highlight some of these points and uh, give you kind of a place to study these things. So um, for this first slide is ta talking about these different views of political power um, that are discussed in the book. Um, so we have a representative democracy. So in terms of, you also often hear political leaders calling the United States a democracy. In fact, as you probably have heard already, um, the United States is not a democracy, um, and it's not really feasible for it to be a democracy because of its size. It is a republic. A republic is one is a type of democracy in which leaders are elected to represent the people. The people do not make direct decisions themselves. So there are cases in the United States where there is direct democracy. Um, this includes, uh, in the United States at least, this include, includes referenda vote. Um, referenda vote are votes when you actually directly pick some type of policy action. For example, you might vote on the legalization of marijuana, gun rights, um, uh, gambling. We had the, a vote for gambling in Michigan in the 90s, uh, and that is and that is direct democracy. Mostly, you have representatives voting for you within government, um, choosing to supposedly represent your interest. So that's called representative democracy. Um, and this is one in which elected leaders are authorized to make decisions, which they supposedly make in the best interest of the people. You know, as we know in reality, this isn't always in the best interest of the, interest of the people. Often it's in their best interest. And of course, we talked about that in the last uh, couple of lectures about how people are generally self-interested, rational, and make decisions for themselves. Sometimes that might be to help others because that's what's in their interest, and sometimes it's not to help others. It's, it's for themselves. So kind of keep that in mind when you watch the news and you learn about policy and what the United States Congress is doing, because often it is not that they're against anybody or evil, they're just self-interested individuals. So there's kind of different negative views of, of political power and how it's exercised in the United States. There's the uh, elite democracy theory, the bureaucratic view, the class view, the pluralist view, and uh, this last one, which I don't think is as important, the creedal passion view. So the first one, the elite view, is uh, generally um, what I've discussed in uh, these this lecture series in terms of the way leaders are, they're elites, they're individuals of a higher class within a society, they're kind of born into their position through wealth or they accumulate wealth in their lifetime. And when we vote for them, we're essentially not voting for those that we want to be elected. And you often hear complaints in this election cycle that either Hillary or Donald uh, are corrupt and we want a different candidate. Well, the elites and what we have can come up with it, are those two candidates, and we're we're selecting among two elites. Um, so this is a pretty common view of American democracy and democracy around the world. So democracy is not always led by the people; it's led by people who are chosen by the people. Um, and there's also this more negative view. It's called the power elite view. And this, if you look at the United States, you might hold this view that all leaders in government, the union leaders, the military officials. Um, academics in higher universities like Harvard, Princeton, uh, the Ivy League, so to speak, um, they kind of form this elite ruling class, which kind of uh, uh, cooperates together to make laws which represent the elite interests, not the interests of the people. Sometimes the people do get something from that, um, but oftentimes it is for themselves. Um, the next view is the bureaucratic view. Um, since we live in a large country, we have a large sprawling government, and as governments become more entrenched, uh, bureaucracies form to kind of uh, 
perform the day-to-day -day functions of the government. And in this view, um, the government isn't really ran, ran by the elites. Um, it's ran by, by non-elected officials um, uh, working in bureaucracies, uh, kind of picking regulations and rules and choosing what to enforce and what not to enforce. This is the bureaucratic view. Um, along with the elite view kind of goes the class view. This is the view that the rich and the multinational corporations really control the political power, and this is becoming increasingly more apparent in the United States as we see um, multinational corporations and really wealthy people um, uh, paying for election campaigns in, in a way that uh, kind of, they're almost buying the elections. Um, they're paying for these ads, which are supposed to, um, TV ads, which are supposed to uh, negatively influence your view or influence your view at however they want to, in, to influence it. And they basically kind of use their money to control society. This is the class view. A more positive view is the pluralist view. And um, this is the view which uh, also kind of, you look at in the United States, you might see this as being the way the United States is political power is divided because people have differing interests and they, they, they base their political decisions on where their interests lie, whether or not it's with, it's with the unions, whether or not it's as a teacher having a union, whether or not it is as a police officer, as a wealthy business magnate. So all these different people have different interests and they support the interests in institutions that protect their values, which they claim to be traditional American values. You often hear these elites saying, we support traditional American values. Well, what are traditional American values? Do we know? I don't know. So that's the pluralist view. The last is the creedal passion view. And this is one in which ideology um, leaders that are extremely conservative or cons extremely liberal or want to spread democracy around the world, they rule the country with zeal, with passion, and they use their ideology to stir up the passions of the populace in order to do things like start wars abroad, to spread democracy around the world. It's not always the most effective way of leading. Um, uh, for example, Donald Trump is is uh, often giving speeches in which he rises up negative sentiment against immigrants, um, using that to potentially get people that might have bad feelings about certain things in order to support them. So they're using ideology to uh, do what they want. And oftentimes they don't necessarily believe that, that, that ideology themselves. These are five views of political power. So what, are, what is the role of the people in these two different types of systems, authoritarian versus democratic systems? Where do citizens stand? Where do you stand? Um, uh, there are two views, uh, and we can kind of look at it from this perspective. Are the citizens there as a subject of the state of the government, or are they citizens with rights? Are the, is the government there to protect them? So are they there at the behest of the state? Does the state... Um, make them, for example, serve in their military? Does it force them to do things they don't want to do, like work on farm cooperatives, farming cooperatives? Or are the people really empowered and able to uh, um, kind of join a political community in which they have a right and responsibility as a citizen, for example, maybe to serve, but also they must obey laws and pay taxes, and by doing that, they are able to essentially live in a free society where they can say what they want, do what they want. That's kind of the notion of democracy, is that you're a citizen. Um, some of these concepts are kind of coming under fire. For example, the notion of military service is less common. Um, there used to be a responsibility to serve in the military. Now it's um, less of a responsibility. It's more of a right. So we're more concerned these days with rights than our our. our our responsibilities as citizens, but in democracies we have both of these rights and we have responsibilities. Um, and so that leads into the idea that there are different types of politics um, that look at these rights and responsibilities within a society. Of course we live in a republic or a democratic society. With a representative democracy we elect our leaders and they, they make decisions for us and these all these views that were they kind of you could all you could kind of fit any of these views, the elite view, the class view, they would all kind of fit into these definitions. Um, but there's these different competing types of politics the book talks about. It talks about politics um, that serve the majority. Often the Democratic Party seeks to serve the majority ver versus 
a, a, a minority, and this is kind of the way a lot of countries look at things. As long as the majority is happy, um, it's not necessarily going to benefit everyone, a policy. There is interest group politics. So these don't really serve anybody but the interest group. For example, um, the oil and natural gas lobby, those that own large oil corporations, seek to have certain pipelines laid out in certain wildlife refuges to go across the country. These don't necessarily benefit everybody. So they, they may claim they benefit everybody, um, but there's a certain set of people that have this um, expertise on this area, and they use that expertise to often obscure um, the reality of the situation. Because generally, when, it's, when we're talking about interest group politics, we're talking about politics and policies that serve one set of people, and that is all. Um, so you see a lot of lobbying in Congress and a lot of things going on that that is there for the interest groups. Um, next, we have client politics. And of course, this is even smaller than an interest group. We have policies that benefit just a small segment of society, and often this benefit hurts the majority. So this is the opposite of majority politics. It's uh, client politics because, for example, a congressman may seek to have um, carbon emissions um, regulations more loose because in their district, uh, there's a lot of fossil fuel burners, um, such as the coal industry, uh, producing power. And if carbon emissions are become more strict, then it costs that industry money. So if they're supporting the congressman by giving him money during his campaign, they would expect some type of client politics relationships. And lastly, we have entrepreneurial politics. And these are policies that benefit society as a whole. Um, but that a small group pays the price for. It's almost the opposite of client politics in the sense that um, we would regulate something because everybody benefits from clean air, clean water, but then those that might want to pollute into the water or the air do not really benefit. They actually have to pay a higher price. So um, it is the question, the existential question, does government exist for a reason? And if it does, um, it, it, should it serve the people as a majority or individuals that support them financially? Um, next, we're going to talk about the origins of Demer American democracy itself. And, you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. I threw this in here because I thought it was relevant. Um, I would like you to look up social contract theory. And this kind of relates to this. this there's this 15th century book called Leviathan, written by Thomas Hobbes, uh, a European philosopher. Um, and he proposed that the government um, was this Leviathan, a giant monolithic beast um, that was necessary to reduce the anarchy between individuals that were self-interested and by their by the very nature of their existence by the competition that exists between individuals that are self-interested um, they would the government would enforce law upon them because they would compete and kill each other and life would be um, to quote Thomas Hobbes uh, nasty solitary brutish and short and so he said before government that was life was like that and now with the government this leviathan there's a social contract in which a society would come up in which a government or this ruling class of individuals would protect the people by raising armies by enforcing laws by enforcing economic exchange and then in exchange for that the people themselves would give up some of their rights and they would have responsibilities to the government for example to serve in the military and uh, so there's kind of this notion um, that rights and responsibilities uh, and this all came about during the enlightenment part of Europe when the kind of the progressive era of Europe um, when they were coming out of the Middle Ages when they were kind of reducing the effects of religious extremism um, and kind of going towards the natural sciences and kind of thinking about the way people interacted with their environment. That's where social contract theory comes up, and it's actually introduced by a guy named John Locke, a liberal thinker. So we have these two thinkers here, the founders of social contract theory, Thomas Hobbes, the one who wrote Leviathan, and the English philosopher John Locke. And any of, if any of you have seen the show Lost, um, there was a character, John Locke. Um, he was actually named after this English philosopher. So John Locke believed in free liberal economic exchange and uh, the right to have property. Um, and so Thomas Jefferson, when he was writing the Declaration of Independence, he based a lot of his theory on the theory that was 
put out by John Locke in his second treatise on government um, in the, I believe it's the 17th or 18th century, in which he, he wrote that uh, these kind of rights that individuals had within a liberal society. So John Locke's kind of the foremost thinker on liberalism, which led to the concept of free economic exchange, um, introduced by Adam Smith in uh, 1776 in the book called The Wealth of Nations. So both of these thinkers are important. You could Google either of these and you'd find it in Wikipedia, and it might be a good idea to look at them, but um, they both introduce ideas that lead to us lead us to understand social contract theory as this connection between the government and the people that are ruled by the government. Um, now, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, the founders themselves, they're all heavily influenced by this thinking. Um, we all know the great patriot Patrick Henry. He was actually an anti-federalist. We'll study this in a couple weeks the, in federalism. Um, he believed less government was, 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 good, was good, whereas the founding fathers, a lot of them believed that some type of strong federal government was necessary. Um, but what they did, uh, and James Madison in particular, the writer of the Constitution, well, there was written by many people, but he wrote most of it. Um, he feared, and many others, like a Alexander Hamilton, another writer of the Constitution, they feared that pure democracy itself. So this is the democracy of direct democracy. We get to exercise it at times in the referenda votes that we have, but mostly we have a representative democracy. Now, and this is partially because the size of our country makes it really difficult to meet with 350 million or whatever million odd people and try to make a decision that way. I mean, we look at our government with... Um, uh, 538 members of Congress. Not much is not much is done. This is this is just a small sliver of, of what it would be if we were talking about pure democracy. So they believed the, um, that factions would formed, and they would make it really difficult because they would only pursue their self-interest. And this is kind of what has happened in our democracy. But they really didn't want the people making decisions for themselves, and there's lots of reasons for that. They believe that people didn't have the knowledge. Um, back then, people weren't as educated, so it's understandable. But even now, individuals are affected by the media. They don't necessarily have a good view of what's going on in government. And that's kind of what, what the purpose of this class is, is to give you the understanding of the structure and the functioning so that you kind of have a, you can kind of look at stuff and kind of filter out the stuff that isn't really useful. So they preferred a republic, and this is essentially a representative democracy. And this whole notion of republican virtue, and that page number on there is actually from a different book, um, but we talk about self-interest and community interest there. Um, so they believe the average citizens really didn't have the information uh, necessary. They were all self-interested, so they would always put themselves before the community, and that would make it difficult for pure democracy to work. Um, and of course, if you look at the United States today, we have referendum votes, so we do have pure democracy. And more locally, you can get in a town hall meeting in, or a homeowners association and kind of make decisions about these small little things. But even in that case, even in that case, you'll find that that's difficult to do. Um, so we have both elements in our country today, but we are more or less a representative democracy. So um, in our country, who is a citizen? I mean, we kind of have this this whole thing going on in the election cycle about uh, about citizens and voting. And really, in our country, a citizen is anybody who was born in this country um, and your parents are also American citizens. And actually, it doesn't even matter if your parents are Americans. Um, they can come here and uh, ha give birth and their child will have American citizenship. And that's because a lot of the people that came here originally were immigrants. So it was this way to kind of bring in talented individuals from overseas, individuals that really wanted to be here, and kind of form this great country that would um, kind of supersede or surpass all the other previous notions of um, citizenship and statehood. <clears throat> And so on and so forth. And there are these two competing images in the United States, of course. Um, we've always had this notion that the United States was a melting pot, right? People came here, they spoke English, uh, they adapted. Uh, this principle of universalism says that um, individuals uh, all strive for rationally self-interested goals, their nationality, and all these things become less important. 
Um, and instead, they kind of uh, blend into this liberal society in which individuals are all pursuing their own goals, and they can kind of live in harmony in that sense. And there's also some sense of nationalism there, because if you conceive of the United States as a melting pot, it's hard to accept those individuals that are speaking different languages, or coming here and trying to retain their own their own um their own ideas uh, from their own countries and that's this older image this melting pot but what's going on in the united states um whether or not it's for the good or for the worse is that we kind of are adopting this multicultural society and you see a lot of resistance to this in some parts of the country that are predominantly white um, with understanding everybody has their own self-interest correct um, in this sense the u.s is a place where people come together they can speak their own languages they can all adapt to the American identity while retaining their own cultural identity. They can be they can be Muslims and be Americans, and it's kind of cosmopolitan. And this is as opposed to universalistic. Um, the people can kind of all live together with their own ideas, but they can all retain um, this idea that this notion of liberal self-interest in which people can economically compete uh, for what they believe to be right. Um, so that's these competing images of the United States. Um, on the conservative side, you see more of the melting pot image. On the liberal side, you see more of the multicultural image. Um, I leave it to you to decide what you think is the better way forward for the United States, and you can exercise your voting rights as an individual um, in that sense. Um, okay, so where this leaves us today... Um, for this unit, for these last three lectures, we've talked about a few different things, kind of introducing you to concepts in American government, teaching you about politics, teaching you about economic and political systems, and about uh, kind of the idea of citizenship ideology and um, where we are as a democracy in the United States. Um, this accompanies the first chapter of the book, and also be sure to view the first two um, introductory videos on the syllabus and on... Um, what kind of my expectations are for the course. I hope you enjoyed this lecture series. Stay tuned next week uh, for a lecture series on the Constitution and the origins of American democracy.